Hey guys, um, this is the video to walk through chapter 9.1. Um, chapter 9 is starting to get pretty exciting, um, at least in STAT 190 terms, because it's where we're going to actually do confidence intervals, real statistics. We're going to be taking data from a sample and from that trying to infer what the true value is for something. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen here and uh, we'll be ready to start. So. Okay, so um, for no particular reason, chapter nine starts with proportions first and then does mean second. You could have done it the other order, and I guess, I don't know, they didn't ask me. Um, but the general idea is we have a point estimate, right? And that's gonna be our data. So just to continue on what we've been doing earlier in the class, I'm gonna be rolling two dice and thinking about how likely we get an eight, okay? And you remember from before, we actually know the true answer for this. So in a way, this is a dumb thing uh, to make a confidence about. Typically, we're going to be looking at real data where we don't know what the true proportion is. So I'm going to do this as a quick example just because it's easy to work through. And the idea is, let's say I'm going to roll the dice 80 times and count how many eights I get. And of course, in StatCrunch, we can simulate that pretty easily. But here I, you know, here I am, I'm just doing that one, two, right, whatever. There I got one, right? So that happened one out of three times. And so that would be our point estimate, so one third would be the point estimate for our proportion. Now we know one third isn't right because my sample size is very tiny. But what we add is this idea of a margin of error. So if we say, well, it's one third plus or minus, that gives us a true estimate for what's going on. And when we think about elections or surveys or anything like that, what we do is we take the data we have from the people that we ask the question to, or the data that we have from the responses um, whatever it is, hospital records or surveys or ecological data or whatever. And we take the point estimate that we just calculate. We just say, well, it happened one out of three times. So that's one third. And then we calculate a point error, I'm sorry, a margin of error using the Z stuff that we had before. So because of chapter eight, we can assume that our data is normal, at least as long as we're studying the, the mean, provided our sample size is large enough. And you remember, um, for means that was 30, for proportions it's NP1 minus P is better than 10. But the idea is we're gonna just take our point estimate, that is our best guess for what we have, and we're gonna take our, mar our point estimate and we're gonna take our margin of error. And between the two, that's gonna give us a confidence interval to do that. Oh man, I'm bad at drawing, okay. So that is what we're gonna do here. Now the margin of error, we're going to calculate using the standard error, which remember we talked about again in chapter eight, and then a critical value, which is a number from the normal distribution. So we're going to work out the probability associated with how confident we want to be in our answer. So the way to think of this isn't that we're getting some core sort of measure of truth, but instead we're thinking about a sampling distribution. So that is, I'm going to roll the dice 80 times and I'm going to make a confidence interval around that. If you repeated that experiment multiple, multiple times, a confidence interval or a confidence level is the idea of what percent of those responses would we expect to fall, uh, to have the true value fall within it. So this idea that there is a true mean and we made one confidence interval, maybe that's the one we collected today, and that's gonna have a confidence interval. If we repeated that 20 times, we would expect 19 out of the 20 to be there if we're going for 95% confidence. Okay, so it's sort of a backwards way to think about probability. Formula-wise, we're just gonna take the stuff we had back in chapter eight. So our estimate of the proportion is just our sample proportion, right? So uh, we have that and our sample error is P1 minus P divided by N square rooted. And we need that N P1 minus P to be bigger than 10 so that we can treat the proportion as approximately normal. Then we want to calculate our confidence interval in such a way that 95% of our results are expected to fall into there. Okay, so think about that on a chart, right? If we assume that it's normal and we assume that our point estimate is the center of that proportion, then we wanna go 95% in the middle, right? So again, that's stuff from chapter seven and stuff from chapter eight that we can use in order to get our estimate to be about how accurate we think it might be. Formula-wise, um, we're gonna look on that table or we could use norms just to calculate that. 
Um, but in fact, the charts are just out there right now. So I just Googled uh, statistics for dummies because I think that's kind of a funny place to go. And they just have a little chart here that if you're gonna do 95%, you're gonna get the number 1.96. If you're gonna do 90% confidence, you're gonna get 1.645. We can use that norms in command in Excel to get that for other uh, probabilities. And there's a table like this in your book. But this idea that when in doubt, we're gonna use 1.96 if we don't want to have as giant a sample size and we were, uh, want to think more about the error in a different way, uh, we might use 90%. Certainly, if you're doing a drug trial or you're doing something in chemistry, you might use this 99% confidence interval for 2.58. And you remember these z values are distances from our sample mean. So just like before when I said um, I'm one standard deviation above the mean for height, and that put me at whatever it was, the third quartile or so, 80th percentile, um, this is saying if we want to get 95% to be in the middle, what z-score do we need? So again, my z-score for height was 1. The z-score for a 95% confidence interval is 1.96. Okay, and so that's just what we're going to do for that calculation. Get the truth back out of there, back to our slides. All right, so we want to think about what happens if our confidence level changes, and we want to think about the p that we're going to have. So we're going to use this uh, point estimate, which is just p hat. So we're going to roll the dice and get the value that we get. The z-score, which is the number from that chart. And then our standard error, which is a number we're going to calculate from our data, p1 minus p divided by n. Again, the stuff that we had in chapter 8. OK, we call that value the critical value, the z alpha, this one here, usual. So the critical value is going to be 1.96 or 1.645 or whatever value it is for the thing that we want to study. Okay, so we get the z-score, we calculate. So it's a mix of look up the number on the table, think about where our data came from and how confident we want to be in our answer, and then we do some arithmetic. Now, we're going to calculate the interval here in a second, but the real idea here is this idea of thinking about this isn't perfect. We don't know that the sample mean is close to the true mean, but we're going to check and see how far the error would be or how off would we be uh, surprised by. Okay, so um, here she has an example, but I'm going to do a different example here from my data. Okay, so in StatCrunch, I just went ahead and rolled the dice uh, metaphorically 80 times. So I rolled the dice 80 times and I counted up how often I got an eight. Now notice that while we think it's gonna have a nice uh, normal curve, it sort of does, but actually eight happened a little bit less than you might think looking at the chart. Anyway, we had it nine times. So nine times out of 80 or 11.25%, which is a little bit under the percent we calculated when we did it as a classical probability. All right, well now I'm gonna switch over here to my uh, Google sheet. And again, I just put in some words and some colors so that we could tell what's going on and let me go back here. All right, so we rolled the dice 80 times. When we did that, we had nine of them come out to be, so that's nine out of 80. Okay, so that's 11.25%. Remember our true proportion, over here with my, there it is. My true proportion is uh, oh, this one, 13%, uh, percent. that's, uh, all right, that is five out of 36. So remember, that's what we calculated back before for what the dice should be. But if I roll the dice 80 times, I don't get, oops, whatever, I get what I get um, as we do that. So um, we got 11 and a quarter percent. So the question is, is that a reasonable estimate? Is 13.89 an accurate thing? Now, thinking about it backwards, what would really happen in practice is 11.25 is all we know. If somebody told me, hey, the probability of rolling two dice and getting an eight is 13.89, what we want to say is, is that guy nuts, right? If it's too far off, then maybe we think our dice are fixed or we didn't do the calculations right, because typically we won't know what the true proportion is for what it is we're studying. Okay, the other number we'll need is that 1.96 uh, number from the table. So 1.96, I'm just going to put that in there. Um, so before we start, we want to make sure our assumptions are good. So we're just going to take n times our p hat, right? That's our probability of getting that, times 1 minus p hat. So again, I'm just going to do the arithmetic here, and we get that value to be uh, 
about eight. Notice that's not quite above 10. Oh, I thought it was. Um, but it certainly isn't. Um, yeah, it certainly isn't. So um, maybe I should do actually a few more. Let's get that a little bit higher to get that up above. And what do I need to get to 100 probably? Well, even 100 is just barely about there. So let's do it 100 times. All right, so we'll go back here and let's roll some more. So five more puts us at 85. Five more puts us at 90. Five more puts us at 95. And remember, each one of these is rolling two dice and just seeing whether or not it's an eight or not. And here we are. So now we have 14 out of 100. So plus 14 out of 100. All right. And now our NP1 minus P is well above uh, 10. OK, the 1.96, again, we got that from the table. So that is what it is Oops, from here. So 1.96 just came from there as we did that. All right, so we're going to need our p hat to do this is just to do our arithmetic like we had here in the formula. Um, let's go back up to my formula. Where did it go? There it is. So we're going to take p hat plus or minus our z score times that standard error. Okay, so p hat is right there. One minus p is again easy one minus p hat. Then we're going to take p hat times one minus p hat. So again, we're just going to do plus that guy times that guy. And that gives us 0.102. Um, notice that's the same number we had over here. I guess I could have uh, kept that number. Then we're going to take that number and divide it by n. And of course, here we could do that in our head because it is 100. So we just move the decimal point over. So we have 12.04 divided by 100 is 0 0.001204. Notice that number is really small. To find the standard error, we're going to just take the square root of that number. Okay, and we get 3.47%. So all I've done, oops, all I've done is this formula right here. So that formula I've just turned into spreadsheet notation to get the value for that. Okay, to do the last step though, what we're going to do is we're going to take our point estimate plus or minus this amount. So remember, this is our standard error. This is our margin of error. And then the whole thing is our confidence interval. Okay, so we have our standard error. Standard error times that z-score is going to be our margin of error. And then the actual plus or minus thing is going to give us our actual confidence interval. So here we are. Now I can do that. And so for that, we're just going to take the amount we got, the 14% plus our margin of error and our p hat minus our margin of error. So that's going to give us a lower and upper bound from 10.5% to 17.5%, right? So 3.5% is our margin of error plus or minus that from our value gives us that. So what that says is based on the data we collected with StackCrunch, rolling the dice 100 times, we think that the real probability is going to be somewhere between 10.5% and 17.5%. Now, in our case, we actually know what the true percent is because we calculated that back in Chapter 5. But again, the real value of these statistical calculations is when you can't know what the true value is. Right Now, because we did 95% for our z-score, um, we would expect that sometimes we're going to be wrong, right? So if we did this multiple, excuse me, if we did this multiple times, we would expect that one time out of 20, 5% of the time, our confidence interval wouldn't capture the true value. But in our case right now, it did, and that's good to know. All right, so let's go through, and now we're going to walk through her example, which she does as a formula. All right, so... This is from a survey. And again, we don't know what the true value is because it's a survey. So we asked 2,512 adults whether or not they believe juries almost always convict the guilty and release the innocent. And of that, 578 said that they thought that juries almost always do that. So she asked for a 90% confidence interval to find what we think the true proportion would be, right? So again, we don't know what the true proportion is. It's kind of unknowable. But of our sample of 2,500 people, 
578 said they thought the jury is almost always convicted the guilty and released the innocent. So now it's just going to be an arithmetic problem. So we put our numbers up here. So we have our N and we have our P hat, 578 out of 25, 12. So 23% is what we got in our uh, sample proportion. So that's our P hat. Then we check the assumption. So first of all, was it a good sample? It was. Is our NP1 minus P um, greater than 10? It is. It's like 400 some. And then the last one is to make sure we're not sampling too much of our proportion, which we're thinking about all American adults. So 550,000 is way smaller than that. Okay, now we're going to figure out what our Z alpha is. And again, we're just going to get that from the chart or from the book or from wherever. She says for 90% confidence interval. So there you go. That's 1.645 is the value of that. So she's going to use that number here in our calculation. And then it just becomes number crunching. So again, here it is in formula notation. You plug the numbers in, 2301 is our P hat from up here. 1.64 is our Z alpha over two. We're gonna take the square root of our proportion, 2301. One minus 2301 is 7699 divided by our sample size. Okay, so then arithmetic, 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 calculator, calculator, calculator. And we get the value of 0.2301 plus or minus this number 0.0138. Okay, and now I scribble on it, so I'll erase that. And that gives us our true confidence interval, which again, isn't a guarantee that that's where the real value is, but we have 95%, I'm sorry, 90% confidence that the proportion of American adults who believe juries almost always convict the guilty and release the innocent is between 21 and 24%. Okay, so that's how we build a confidence interval using data that we have. Again, my example, we could check because the dice we have, we spent you know, all this time talking about it, we know what the true probability is. People aren't like that. And in fact, the sample even changes over time as we get more uh, different people um, in the population, right? People get old, people die, people come into our sample, whatever it is. So that idea that we're using this to estimate a true survey. Now, this is exactly what they're doing when they say we asked a thousand people, are they gonna vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden? This is exactly the same calculation that they're doing. One last thing in section 9.1 is to go backwards. And the idea here is that margin of error is the plus or minus. So how wide our confidence interval is, is just gonna be two times that. We can calculate for that myth, myth for that width, width. And, right, and to fiddle with that, you can change the level of confidence because that lets you get a bigger or smaller Z alpha or two or we can get a bigger sample size because the Z is on the bottom of the fraction. So getting a bigger sample size will make a smaller margin of error as we do that. We can actually take it even a step for, further and say, gosh, if we want to um, find a particular margin of error, for instance, on TV, they always like to say, um, you know, whatever it is, 56% of people say they're gonna vote for Joe Biden plus or minus 3% they can do the calculation backwards. So this is just an algebraic right, rewriting of the formula, solving for n. So you have to square both sides and uh, work it out from there to get what uh, um, n you'd need for a particular margin of error. So you'd put 0.033 in here or whatever number you want and figure out what n you have to get. And um, for instance, here is the same example again. If we wanted to get another one and we wanted to say, I wanted to not be off plus or minus three, but I want to be plus or minus 0.01, how many would I get? Okay, so if I want to uh, base it off of there, I would just plug the numbers in, plug, 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 arithmetic, 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 and it would say you need 20,000 people to do that. And of course, 20,000 is a lot, which is why most surveys don't have that small of a margin of error. And in fact, to get the plus or minus 3% that we see in most uh, national surveys done in the United States, you need a sample of about 1,100, which is a way easier number to get. And like I said, most of those numbers you see from Gallup or Pew or CNN or whoever, um, those polls use that. Okay, and so that is um, chapter 9.1, an introduction to confidence intervals. 9.2 is gonna do the same thing, but for means instead of for proportions.